views about who God is, about what the Bible is. I'm sorry, kids, I'm sorry, children's choir. Sorry, excuse me. Anyway, so we're, we're going to engage them into reading the Bible and I uh, want to encourage you to be reading through the Gospel of Mark and think how you, uh, part of this is you're learning how a way to, to do a Bible study with somebody. A lot of times we, you know, we, I mean, we're, we're the, you know, we're the, let's face it, we're the drive up to one window, order, go to the next one, pick up our food generation. Uh, we, we want things like this, and a lot of times we want a gospel pres- pres- presentation that's going to be, you know, okay, I'll meet you at the door, and, and you're, you, know, you get saved now. Now, it's exciting when you get that opportunity to lead someone to Christ. It's always exciting, but it's usually because there's been somebody else who sowed the seed before you ever got there. Um, so we are in the process of sowing, and at times God gives us the privilege of reaping, and we like the reaping process, but we also should like the sowing process. All right, so it's a great opportunity as you go through the Gospel of Mark uh, to engage in thinking through it. And, and really, I understand, Mark wrote his, I mean, the Gospels are written uh, to expose people to Christ. And Mark wrote and recorded the events to, to really engage an audience as he's writing to them into who Jesus is, why Jesus came, really what's it all about. And so we get into the mission, the, you know, the identity of Christ being brought forward, the mission of Christ will be brought forward, and then the calling of Christ, calling people to come and follow, and what it means to be a disciple, and ultimately what, I mean, what salvation means, discipleship means, all of it's being spelled out through the Gospel of Mark. So uh, we look in the Gospel of Mark and just some simple questions, and you should have read through Mark uh, chapter 3 up through chapter 5, and we see these various events. And as you see the events recorded, Jesus calling a storm, Jesus healing a man who's, who's been possessed by a demon, uh, Jesus uh, healing somebody who's sick, and then coming to raising the dead. I mean, these uh, it's just tying back to what we've already seen, Jesus' authority, and that's really what he's bringing forward to us. We're seeing his authority over, so if he can calm a storm, he has authority over what? Over all nature, okay? I mean, he's in control. I mean, he is sovereign over nature. He, is, uh, he can heal the demons, so he has authority over all the demonic cohort. That's why the Bible would say, if you draw near to God, the devil will flee far from you, okay? Uh, so he has all authority over the, uh, the, all the demons. He, he heals the sick, so he has authority over the physical body, over the well-being. He, he can raise the dead, and then now we're elevating everything, right? He not only has authority over sickness, he has authority over... Life and death. And so we, we see the elevation. And really, uh, it's all focusing in on the identity of Christ and the, the claims of Christ and what Christ has for his, his, his memory. We, we know the, God, the, the Great Commission, he has all authority in heaven and earth. And throughout his life, he demonstrated that authority, to, authority over everything. Uh, and so all, all creation, he demonstrates his authority. Of course, the climactic mir- miracle in that section is the raising of, of, of Jairus' daughter. And so uh, Jairus' daughter, uh, you know, they come to Christ, and, and I mean, they come, Jairus has come to Christ, and they, they come and report to, to Jairus that uh, uh, his daughter is dead. Don't bother to teach her. So how does Jesus respond to that? You look at verse 36 in chapter. All right, he tells him, don't be afraid, just believe. I mean, it's a pretty incredible statement, right? I mean, you think about it. He tells him, don't be afraid, just believe. And the question that Sam would ask, you know, and, and, and in the, I like this question in the, in the Christianity Explorer, and I don't know if I have it right there. Is that it? Yeah, all right. So the question is, is reasonableness of the request. You think about it. The report comes. She's dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Jesus said, don't be afraid, only believe. Well, that's quite the statement, right? Believe what? Well, the implication is believe what? Believe in him because she may be dead, but he can do something about this, right? I mean, that's the implication stated in there. Now, when we talk about a reasonable, then you're kind of drawn in to say, okay, we look at all the authority, the things Jesus done, you might conclude maybe he can. Here's one of the realities. Faith is only reasonable for those who have their eyes open to see it. Okay? 
Faith is, it's based on, I mean, it's based on reality. I mean, you don't make blind leap of faith. Christianity is not a blind leap of faith. It's built on objective reality of who God is, what God's promises are, what God has done. But only the eyes that have been illumined by the Spirit of God can see reality for what it is. I love doing, when we did the Truth Project, you remember in the Truth Project? What's the definition of insanity? Okay, that's one, but the other definition that you mentioned in there is what? You're insane if you don't have the right perception of reality, right? Insanity is to not understand reality. Guess what? Without Christ, without God's illuminating, illuminating our heart and mind, we don't understand reality. We don't understand right and wrong. We don't understand what, what life's about. We don't see truth. And so here, as, as, as Christ is doing, and you see, and in fact, they're going to ask the next uh, in the next one, in the next set of questions you see, is you see all these different responses that happen. And part of those responses are connected to how people see reality, how they interpret what they just saw. And, uh, you know, we, we live in a day when people, you know, depending on the Christian circles, quote, unquote, you run in, a lot of people are into, quote, miracle working and all this other stuff. And there are the people who think, man, if, if everybody's just doing miracles and healing and all this was happening, everybody just believed. Well, Jesus did all that stuff. Everyone didn't believe. Because it takes the eyes open by the Spirit of God to ever, and really takes a divine interpreter of, of those kind of events before you'd ever really understand them. So we see all these different responses that happen. So in Mark chapter 40, uh, I mean, it's Mark chapter 4, verses 40 and 41. Uh, we find the response of the, of the disciples here to the calming of the storm, and it says they were afraid. They were amazed, afraid, depending on it. I think it's probably better amazed. I mean, they're, they're, they, they understand who Jesus is, but the full apprehension of his authority is not, uh, they're, they're getting it. Their eyes are consistently being opened further and further uh, to the extent of his authority. And that happens in our life, too. It happens all the time. I mean, we know that we're supposed to pray what? Pray believing, not doubting. You know, if we pray doubting, we're a double-minded man, James would say. We'll be unstable in all our ways. But at times, we can be like, uh, you know, like the disciples when they're praying and Peter's in prison. You know, and the Lord answers prayer and Peter gets out and runs to the house, knocks on the door. And the servant girl runs back and says, Peter's at the door. And they say, no, you must have seen a ghost. I mean, here they're gathered in a prayer meeting for Peter to be released. God releases Peter. He comes to the door, and they're saying, no way. And we can be a lot like that. At times, we're praying about something. We can be praying about the fall fair and about fruit coming and about an unsaved guest. You may have a neighbor you've invited many times to church or somebody you want to see come uh, to hear the gospel, and you're thinking, there's no way they're going to do it. And we can be a lot like that. We pray that way, and then God does something, and we're amazed. Now, the disciples were like that. Their perception, their understanding continues to expand and who Christ is and the extent of his authority, we see their response to it. In chapter 5, verse 15, we see the response of the people, the crowd, and when the demon-possessed man is healed, again, they're afraid. They don't know what to make of this, one with that kind of authority and power. The woman is healed, the woman who has faith. She responds in faith to Christ when he confronts her and says, you know, I mean, she's come and she believes she can just touch his garment and she's healed. And she is, and Jesus said, your faith has made you whole. Jairus' his whole family, Jairus, is sorry, his whole family is amazed uh, as Christ works in this situation, raising their daughter from the dead. Look back at chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 1 to 12, chapter 2. And when they had returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many people gathered together so that there was no room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them, and they came, bringing to him a paralytic, paralytic, a paral I can't even pronounce here. Yes, a paralytic, thank you. Carried by four men. And when they could, get, they could not get him near because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they'd made an opening, they let down the, the bed on which the paralytic, I can't say that word, sorry. Yeah, there we go, paralytic. Yeah, the sick guy, yeah, the guy who can't walk. <laughs> Thanks, Richard. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said, oh, there we go, good. That's the one I'm tripping over all night. You just say it, fill it in, you know what it is. Uh, you're so <laughs> 
Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning their hearts and says, oh, it says, why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they had questioned within themselves, said, why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, uh, your sins are forgiven, or say, rise, take up your bed and walk, but that you may know the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, pick up your bed and go home. And he arose and immediately picked up his bed and went, went before them all. So they were amazed and glorified God, saying, we've never seen anything like this at all. And so we find in this account, the huge crowd is there, and, and they're there. Why is the crowd there? And you read the first chapter, hopefully, right? What's been going on? Everywhere Jesus is going, what's happening? He's healing. He's healing, and everywhere he's going, he's healing. The report is Jesus is back in Capernaum. Everybody comes. Everybody's bringing their sick. Everybody's crowding around, and so here's the lame guy and his friends, and they're coming, and they want to get to Christ, right? They're coming to bring their friend, and why are they coming? Yes. Yeah. 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 Right. Well, there's there's a lot of mixed motives, but they are coming because they of the healing going on, right? I mean, there's a healer. Jesus is healing. People are amazed. They're not what to sure what exactly to make of it. They're trying to figure out who this guy is. Where does this power come from? Uh, But all they know is people are being healed, and this guy teaches like nobody else we know. We're hearing reports about this, so it's spreading. So Jesus' fame is spreading. Word is traveling. It's going to travel fast. I mean, this is not usual fare. I mean, Jesus is healing, and people are being healed, and so the word is spreading, and people are obviously talking about who this might be. There's grumbling. I mean, there's, there's people talking, could this really be the Messiah? That undertone is there. People are, are coming to see it for themselves. And so, I mean, everybody in, in the area is showing up. And so it's not hard to picture the scene with the house overflowing, no room to get in. And so they, these guys bring their friend because they bring their friend because they've heard about Jesus. All they've heard about Jesus, we don't know. But apparently it's quite a bit because Jesus is going to say something about faith, right? So they've heard uh, and they, they're the, all that's going on about this being a Messiah and, and all that undertones is out there. And so they're coming and they're coming with the hope that Jesus would heal their friend. And theologically, how they made all the connections to, to sin and sickness and all of that, um, I, you know, what exactly they, they were thinking there, we're really not clued in on. But when they begin to they let their, their friend down, what's the first, what, how does Jesus then address him? What does he say? Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, please understand, Jesus is not saying that you're lame and on this mat because your, your sin has caused this. But now all, all sickness is a result of we live in a sin-cursed world, okay? Because we live in a sin-cursed world, sickness comes. Now that doesn't mean when you get sick, God's punishing you for your sin by that sickness. We live in a fallen world, and our bodies are impacted by living in a fallen world. So we get sick, we face all kinds of things from, uh, from the paralysis or from cancer to all the different kind of diseases that come as a part of living in this fallen world. But Jesus addresses the greatest need, right? And here's one of the things. We live in a day today where we're all, a, lot of, you know, uh, a lot of social action takes place and, and there's good cause to be socially active, to help people in need. But a lot of times that gets confused with the nature of gospel ministry. Okay, people's greatest need is to know Christ. Now, it didn't mean they don't have physical needs. It didn't mean they don't have practical need help. It didn't mean that you can't help people in practical ways and can't serve in that way. Those are all good things to do. But if we do those at the negligence of the gospel, we help people not at all. Not really. In fact, we get it all confused when we put a priority in the wrong place. Jesus is communicating a priority here. Your per, your person's, this guy's being let down. He's been paralyzed. How long exactly? Not as sure. He's paralyzed. And so he's been paralyzed, his friends are bringing him, they're hoping Jesus can heal, he's obviously hoping Jesus can heal him, and they're thinking to themselves, and maybe, maybe based on Jesus' statement, uh, I would guess that this paralytic, paralytic, 
has concluded that Jesus must be the Messiah if he has this kind of power. And he is hoping the Messiah will have compassion on him. And Jesus addresses his first and greatest need, which is a reconciliation in a relationship with God. And so he announces his sins to be forgiven. And obviously Christ, and one of the things that is often missed in all this miracle, we see the healing, we see all that. You notice the, the response of the Pharisees right away is what? You're blaspheming, right? You're a blasphemer. You're forgiving. You, you can't do that. Only God can forgive sins, right? And what does the text tell us Jesus did? Well, the miracle, don't miss it. What? He knows their thoughts, right? They perceive this in their heart. Jesus knows exactly what they're thinking. Now, you know, that was one of those that you kind of go by that and you miss the fact nobody was amazed by that. I mean, he immediately addresses what they're thinking, right? And, and, and of course, we could go in all kinds of ways of applying that reality. God always knows exactly what we're thinking, regardless of what we're saying. All right? So here, here Jesus uh, deals with the, the, the sin issue, and he addresses that the man's fundamental need is a, re a reconciled relationship with God to deal with their sin. In fact, this whole lesson tonight we're going to focus in on is going to focus on the reality of sin, the problem of sin, and I appreciate the emphasis given here and that it is a, a heart issue. It is a personal issue. And so we need a personal reconciliation and, and personal forgiveness. That's all needed by sinners before God. And so Jesus addresses this. The, 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 of course, the, the teachers say, uh, you're blaspheming because only God can forgive sins. So did they get it right? Well, yes and no. They got part of it right. Only God can forgive sins. The part they didn't get right is they accuse Jesus of blaspheming. But he's not blaspheming because he is God. That's the point, right? And that's Jesus' whole point here, part of the whole point. Yes, I am God. And I have the authority. In fact, he uses the title, and the Son of Man has authority. And that's drawn out of Daniel. It's a title given to the Messiah. And they didn't miss it. They understood when he used that title, he was calling himself their Messiah. That he is God of very gods. He is the, the promised one of God, the promised Messiah who has come, who has authority to forgive sins. So don't let anybody ever tell you that Jesus did not make it profoundly clear during his earthly ministry that he was God. Jesus made it profoundly clear. The Jews did not miss the point. They understood exactly what Jesus was saying about himself. But it also reveals the fact that information does not change hearts. Only God can bring life to that which is dead. God must open eyes to see. Because they saw the miracles. They were in the presence of Christ. They understood what he was saying. But they did not, they did not all believe, obviously. And so the teachers of the, of the law made this. And then the, the, obviously the clear indication here is, does Jesus have the authority to forgive sins? Absolutely. And that's a very important issue when you tie it all together. The whole flow here is the fame is spreading because Jesus is healing. Jesus does not want this to become about healing. It's about the gospel. And the gospel message is you must repent and believe. You must turn from sin and believe that the fundamental issue is man's, because if the fundamental issue was healing and getting rid of that, folks, he could have ended all sickness during his earthly ministry. If the fundamental issue, the biggest problem with humanity is the fall, is how it's impacted our body and, and the sickness that comes from it, if that was the, really our greatest problem, Jesus could have dealt with that forever at that moment. But he didn't, because it's not the fundamental need. The fundamental need is sin. And he came to highlight that and to be the answer for sin forever. He came, even as our text this morning said, he came in the likeness of sinful flesh, though not a sinner, for sin, to deal with sin, and he condemned sin in the flesh. That is, he took sin on himself on the cross of Calvary, and he dealt with sin once and for all. 
And so this topic of sin is very fundamentally important. As you're sharing the gospel, folks, listen to me. You have to deal with people being sinners, and they have to understand that before they can ever be saved. Repentance is a part of the gospel. Apart from turning from sin to God, no one is saved. The half gospel is so dominant in our culture today, just believe in Jesus and add Jesus to your life or you know, get all these benefits, Jesus and all of this, does not deal, that does not adequately deal with man's sinfulness is not really the gospel. Jesus came to deal with sin and he exposes sin and he shows fundamentally here, I have authority to deal with sin. That's good news because all of you are sinners. That was the point. All right, go ahead, Kevin. We're going to look at this lesson on sin. When I started college in 1991, I joined the rugby club. It was quite competitive, so I was sent a strict summer training schedule, which I immediately put in the bin. Anyway, September rolled round, and I arrived for club testing and training, feeling fairly confident. When I got there, all the guys were very quiet, which was unusual. Then suddenly, the coach came in and said, right, We'll start with the bleep test. The bleep test is a test where you run back and forth over 20 yards in time with a bleep that gets faster and faster. You run until you drop. In my case, that was not long in coming. I was the second to drop out, having collapsed and been physically sick. Next, we had to strip down to our shorts for the so-called fat test. Why not leave this part of the story to the imagination? Basically, the fat test is when your fat content is measured by this contraption that pinches the flesh all over your body. As it turned out, there was actually one other person who had an even higher percentage of body fat than me. We became firm friends. Well, flabby friends, really. The results of all these tests were recorded and publicly announced, and it was extremely humiliating. Eventually, when all the tests had been completed, the coach got us all together and said, well, it's not comfortable but at least we found out the truth on the training ground before the real questions get asked during the proper game. Sometimes we experience things in life that give us a shocking dose of reality, things that expose us in an extremely uncomfortable way. But as our coach said, it's better to find out the truth about ourselves while we still have time to do something about it. We've already explored who Jesus is. The question now is, why did Jesus come? Did he want to bring peace on earth? Was it to heal disease and end the sufferings of the world? Did he want to transform society and give us an example of how we ought to live? According to Mark, although there's an element of truth in all those options, they're not the main reason Jesus came. When we look at the world, there's so much to marvel at. But who can honestly say, the world is all good? Estimates vary, but histories of the 20th century suggest that at least 100 million people died violently in those 100 years. That is 2,400 violent deaths every day. The question is, why is the world like this? Jesus tells us the uncomfortable truth in Mark's Gospel. He insists that the reason there's something wrong with the world is because there's something wrong with us. Imagine for a moment a huge public gallery. On display for the whole world to see is the story of your life. It's a complete and truthful account, not only of everything you've ever said and done, but also of every thought that has ever crossed your mind. Nothing is edited out. Everything is here for everyone to look at. Now I'm sure there'd be lots that you'd be relatively proud of. Loving relationships, real achievements, acts of kindness, moments of generosity, perhaps a flourishing career. 
but there would also be thousands of things you'd want to keep out of the public eye. Which bit of the wall would you most want to cover up? Maybe it's something nobody knows, not even your closest friend. And it's not just the things we've said, done, and thought that are a problem. There are the things we should have done, and the words we should have said. If my life were on those walls, it would be a nightmare. I'd hate my life to be on display for everyone to see. I'd be so ashamed. I wouldn't be able to look people in the eye. Could you, if you're being honest? So what is the problem? Why is there so much to be ashamed of? Jesus gives us the answer in Mark chapter 7. What comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. For from within, out of men's hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. So when we look at the world and see all the things that are wrong with it, we instinctively want to point the finger at others. But Jesus says, the problem is much closer to home. The reason the world is not the way it's supposed to be is because we're not the way we're supposed to be. And if we were to trace all the evil in the world back to its source, says Jesus, the place we'd end up is the human heart. For the people of Jesus' day, the heart was not simply the pump that sends blood around the body. It was thought of as the seat of human personality. It was the real you. Why is it so hard to keep good relationships going? Why do we hurt those we love most? Why can't we automatically do what we know is the right thing? And why are we so often tempted to do what we know is wrong? Because each of us has a heart problem. Unfortunately, according to Jesus, our problems don't end there. It's not just that we often treat each other and our world in a shameful way. We treat God in that way too. In Mark chapter 12, Jesus tells us how we should relate to God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Jesus calls this the most important commandment and with good reason. Because God made us and sustains us and gives us every good thing we enjoy, what should be our response to him? Jesus tells us. We should love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the really scary word here is all. It means that no part of our lives is to be withheld from God. He is to have all of everything. But that's not our heartbeat. We decide exactly what we'll do with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We give our hearts to lots of things, but not to our Creator. We barely know His commands let alone seek to obey them. We develop relationships with others, but neglect the very relationship for which we were primarily designed. And instead of loving God, we live as if we were God. And that's what the Bible calls sin. So why did Jesus come? According to Mark's Gospel, Jesus came to cure our heart problem, the problem of our sin. Here's what happens in Mark chapter 2 verses 15 to 17. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Notice how uptight these people are with Jesus. They're called the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, and they were the religious establishment. They were always at the synagogue, always praying, always trying to do the right thing. And they are furious here because Jesus is spending time with all the people they love to look down on, especially tax collectors who were hated because they worked for the occupying Roman forces. But the shock for us, as it was for many religious people at the time, is Jesus' statement in verse 17. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. 
I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. You see, Jesus knows that when we look at our world and the state of our hearts, no one can seriously claim to be righteous. No one has managed to love God with all their heart, all their soul, all their mind, and all their strength. If we were able to live like that, there'd be no reason for him to have come at all. No, says Jesus, I haven't come to call people who think they're good, who think they have nothing to be ashamed of. I've come for people who can see what's going on in their own hearts, people who realize they're desperately in need of a cure. If that's you, then I hope you can begin to see why Mark describes Jesus as good news. The qualification for coming to Jesus is not, are you good enough? It's, are you bad enough? He's come for people who realize they're bad, not for people who think they're good. That's the real reason Jesus came. And isn't it ironic that these religious people who think that their hearts are perfectly acceptable to God are the very ones who end up plotting to kill Jesus. So Jesus says, I've not come to call the righteous but sinners. But why did Jesus feel the need to call sinners at all? For the answer to that question, we need to look at the most disturbing verses in Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, verses 43 to 48. It's here that Jesus tells us just how serious our heart problem really is. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands, to go into hell where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. I was in Australia visiting a friend and he took me to a beach on Botany Bay. So I decided I had to go for a swim. I was just taking off my shirt when he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm going for a swim. He said, but what about those signs? I said, oh, don't be ridiculous. I'll be fine. He said, listen, mate, 200 Australians have been killed by sharks. You've got to decide whether those signs are there to save you or to ruin your fun. You're of age, you decide. And with that, he walked off down the beach. When we hear Jesus' words about hell, we have to ask ourselves, why would he talk like this? Is he trying to manipulate us, trying to scare us, just so he can gain control of us? Or is he giving us a loving warning? For me, as I look at Jesus' life and the way he treated people, I see the most loving man who ever lived. Even people who were rejected by the rest of the world were deeply loved by him. The reason Jesus warns us about hell is surely because he loves us and does not want us to go there. He knows that if we reject God throughout our lives, then ultimately God will be right to reject us. He knows that our sin, if left undealt with, will take us to a place of unimaginable and unending suffering. He warns us because he loves us. But here's the problem. Jesus is not giving us the cure for our sin when he talks about cutting off a hand or a foot or gouging out an eye. Even if we were to do that, the knife would never go deep enough. It would never get to the heart of the human problem, which is the problem of the human heart. The urgent reality is that our hearts are desperately in need of a cure. And no matter what we do, as history has shown, we cannot cure it ourselves. But that is why Jesus came. As much as I hated the fat test and the bleak test, it was far better for me to be exposed as unfit on the training ground than in front of spectators in a crucial game. In the same way, Jesus exposes what we're really like so that we can respond to him while there's still time. We'll never understand why Jesus came until we see the reality of our own hearts. And if we don't see that, we'll go through life without noticing that actually we are in terrible danger. I know. All right. It's a powerful lesson dealing with uh, 
our sin nature and really exposing it. And I think uh, I think I shared a, well after I I'd watched all these I shared the one illustration because I thought it was so powerful. But here's one a good one is you're sharing with others their need of gospel. Uh, a good question to ask them is just give them that hypothetical. If we were to take a, a film of your life and show everything, how would that be? How would that go? Because we deal with the fact, we, we deal, live with a lot of self-righteousness, all right? We live in a culture, and people want to believe they're good enough, and I've done good enough, and obviously the Pharisees are, the, are a classic example, and there are those who, the tax collectors were just absolutely the scum of the earth in, in the self-righteous mind uh, to the self-righteous Pharisees. They thought they were so above, uh, far above them. And at times we can do that to people as well. We can be very self-righteous. We can think we're better than other people. Uh, all of that is just, I mean, it's just part of the exposing of just how wicked our hearts are. I mean, when I want to put myself above anybody else, like I'm better than somebody else, it's just part of the wickedness of my heart. Because as a sinner, that is all we are. We are sinners. I don't, sir, I think, I think we've covered everything that's, yeah, that's actually next week. We're, we're good. You don't need anything else up there. Sorry. Uh, yeah, that'll be next week. But as we, we, we're going to read through this text and, and read through these passages next week, and our, yeah, this week, and then talk about it next week. But I think it's just a, one, I mean, a tremendous illustration for all of us to think through the issue of sin and how we illustrate it. Because, again, I come back to this reality. Until people understand that their greatest need is a transformation of their very nature. We don't add Jesus to our life. We don't do the try Jesus, got Jesus, all the little you know, popular phrases or whatever people want to stick out there. The reality is, is we are our problem. And our hearts have to be transformed by God himself or we're going to hell. And so he gives that, that dynamic language, cut off the hand, cut off the foot, gouge out the eye, it would be better for you to, to think about it. It would be better to go through life with inconvenience and suffering than to go to hell. That's what he's saying over and over again. Look, it would be bad to live with the life without vision. It would be bad to live life without your feet or without your hands. And, and there are people who are born that way or are blind, etc. And they have, they, accidents happen and they go through life with all that kind of, uh, of suffering part of their life. And Jesus is just saying, look, you would be better off to live all of your life with that kind of suffering, with that kind of trial, than you would ever be to be whole. Live life like this life is about you enjoying all your hands and feet and eyes can do and spend eternity in hell. This life is a vapor that's passing quickly. Hell is forever. And I love his language, and, and this is reality. Jesus is the most loving person to ever live the earth. He is also the one in your Bible that talks the most about hell. So don't ever let people sell you that line. You shouldn't talk about hell. The God who loves wouldn't send people to hell, right? Yeah. Well, I love this, this statement, too. You can tie, it ties into this lesson. Good people go to hell. Bad people go to heaven. That's kind of the opposite of what most people think, isn't it? Good people go where? To hell. Why? Because they think they're good. You think you're good? You think you're good enough? You're going to hell. Because there's none good, not one. Only God is good, right? Good people go to hell. Bad people go to heaven. And that's kind of in the opposite direction of what we tend to think. We live in a world filled with, well, well, God wouldn't send good people. I mean, I'm good people. God wouldn't send me to hell, right? You're exactly the person who's going to hell. Why? Because you're not good. You deny the reality of your problem in your own heart. And only those who know their heart condition and understand their sinfulness will ever turn from sin, repentance, and come to Christ. And so when we, we I mean, I... Years ago, I did, did one of my, uh, among my many papers in seminary, but just dealing with the whole issue of the gospel and uh, the, the anti-repentance gospel that is so prevalent in America and making repentance nothing more than an intellectual assent or repentance is, I didn't believe Jesus is God, now I do. Uh, there's such minimalization often given to the gospel. Uh, and, and it's done to the, to the peril of people. 
People need to understand they are hopelessly lost sinners. And until they understand that, they are never, their eye, I mean, and God has to open their eyes to see it, but you do no one a favor by suggesting they're not that bad and Jesus can help their life be better. No, they're hopelessly lost. And their heart is their problem. And until they come to Christ, and fi- until their eyes are open to see it, their eyes are never going to behold, really, the good news. And I love the fact he said it this way, too. Jesus is presented throughout Mark's gospel as the good news. Or to borrow from a book we did in men's Bible study a few years ago, God is the gospel. The gospel is good news, not in the sense of the way it's often presented, your escape card from hell. The gospel is good news because through the gospel you come to know God. And the gift of the gospel is Christ. Good news is Christ. He came to deal with our sin. And he came to expose it and deal with it, and we must make sure that we are exposing sin in how we, how we, how we deal with people in the gospel. And so I, I hope it gave you some good ideas on how to talk with those that you know who need Christ, how to help open a window into their heart about dealing with their own sinfulness. And so it's a great question to ask people, because if you're, you want to be honest, we all should be honest. I mean, if we're all honest, there's not a chance I want you to see everything, I mean, let's not even make it my life. Here, let let me draw in a little bit closer. If I could record everything for this next week that you do say and think, and then we're going to come in for movie night next Sunday night, and it's going to be Scott Balin's life for the week. Everything on display, unedited. Think that you'd like that one? Why? Because we're still sinners. And as still sinners, there's things and thoughts and and, and attitudes and responses that go on in our heart that at times go unchecked that we would want no one to know. And if that's true about people who know Christ, I mean, I, I, I mean, I know what you know what I struggle with in my own in my own actions and attitudes at times. I also know what I used to struggle with when I before I knew Christ, and I promise you. I'm glad you don't know that guy. I'm glad you don't know that guy. And I'm glad you never will. There will be a never a day you're going to know that guy. Because unless you knew me then, and the only one in this room knew me then is this one right here. And she married me, don't ask me why. (laughs) But you didn't know me then, and I'm glad. And I am glad that my life will never be put on that kind of display. But you know what? Jesus Christ's life could be. He lived a life on this earth with sinners. Everything he ever did, said, thought could be recorded and displayed. Because he was without sin. And that is our high priest who came to deal with sin and to set us free from it. Aren't you glad? Let's pray.